I'm so glad you decided to gather, man. That's important to God. It's important to the life of our church. So thanks for being here. Uh, we're in a, a, a new series. We started last week. You might see the t-shirts. It's called Set Apart. And I've got a title for today. And it's called No Plan B. No Plan B. All right? Now, we started off last week, and we'll do it again this week, is a, a little set of scripture. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is busy planting churches and teaching people how to follow Jesus and, and how to do church and how to live this life. And, and he had some important words to say, and we're going to just kind of borrow them this morning. In Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, he's talking to people that are new believers, right? They don't, they're, they're learning how to follow Jesus and, and how to live this life and how to do church. And he's saying, I urge you, he's saying this is important, it's an important part of doing that. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, people that are in the faith, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice that is acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So what I'm hoping today is today will be like a defining moment in your relationship with God. That something would happen that you, that, that, that you would leave here differently. That's the goal every single week. And really the goal today is to build your faith. That's the, the goal I have. That's the agenda I have today. And we're going to be looking at the life of a guy named Elisha. Elisha. All right? And I want, I want to give you some context. So if you want to open your Bible... If you want to look at the screen, if you want to pull out your app on your phone, that's, that's cool too. Uh, we're going to be at 1 Kings 19 mostly. And so we want to look at that. We're going to look, um, we're going to look at how this started and give it some context. And before Elisha was a prophet named Elijah. Okay, He did a lot of bold things. He was a prophet, so he did a lot of daring things. Man, he just really believed in God and lived that life that was full of faith. And we, what we're going to decide, uh, what we're going to discover is, is that Elisha wanted to be just like him, except he was bold enough to ask God for double the portion of Elijah's anointing. He said, you know, God, everybody knows what you did through Elijah, all the miracles, all the awesome things. I want double that, God. I want to do that much for you. And the awesome thing is God did it. God gave him that. And as a result, Elisha actually made, uh, uh, was a part of more miracles than anybody in all of scriptures with the exception of Jesus. So it's somebody to pay attention to for sure. And what's interesting about this guy is he was a pretty ordinary guy. He wasn't the son of a priest. He wasn't born into anything that was spiritual. You know, he didn't have any, he wasn't a spiritual giant or anything that stepped up to it. He was just an ordinary guy, man, working at home, living at home, working, doing like a lot of people, was working hard on the family farm. And he, he was doing that when God called him to do something incredible. Okay, so if you're like me, I like to know when things happen. Like, give me a timeline. When was this going on? And when this was happening was in the ninth century B.C., okay? What our church has come to, to uh, value is the Old Testament. We believe it has everything to do that points to the life of Jesus, and there's so much to learn about from the Old Testament. And so what was going on back in the, these days, this is close to 900 years um, before Jesus came to earth. And what was going on in the time of Israel, it was very divided. A lot of tension was happening. And we understand that, don't we? A nation that was divided with a lot of, a lot of tension. And many were worshiping, man. It just it seems like the whole nation just started worshiping Baal. All right? You were almost in a minority if you weren't in some way. And God raised up like he always does. He, he raises something up. And we, we know it in our life as Jesus but, but God would raise up this ordinary guy, and he would do extraordinary things. So in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, the Bible says this. It says, so Elijah, the, that's the older prophet, the guy that's been around a while. He's looking for his successor. God said, I've got a successor for you. Went from there and found son of Shaphat. All you need to know about him is that's his dad. That's Elisha's dad. He's got apparently a lot of money, a lot of land, a lot of animals. It's a, uh, it had been great to be his son because kind of all your needs are met, right? It says, he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. And Elijah went up to him, just real weird like, you know, just kind of out in the middle of this pasture. Uh, Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Some of your scriptures say mantle uh, around him. And Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. 
It's like, this was weird, but I understand what this means. And he says, let me kiss my mother and father goodbye, and then I'll come with you. And Elijah said, go back, and what have I done to you? Realize the significance of what this means, and he would have. So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen, and this is crazy, it makes no, no, no sense, and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Steaks for everybody, right? Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Now, this is a crazy and extreme kind of introduction to, to Elisha's, and, I, and it's got a particular message I want to kind of press down on today is, I don't want you, my biggest fear is that you would miss your season, something God's called you to, something specific that you might talk yourself out of, through, out of it through time or distraction or just hesitancy. And I don't want you to do that because, man, we understand this. We understand this as, as uh, people in the Western world now. Uh, there's a season for things that you can't miss or you'll miss out, right? And, we, and God's kind of taught us spiritual seasons in our life, right? And I think he's done that through the natural, through summer, fall, winter, and spring. We know there's a, there's a change. There's something coming. And God, I think God wants us to under that spiritually. And, man, we can't miss it because we'll miss something significant. For instance, uh, in our context, pumpkin spice. It's pumpkin spice season, right? Do I hear any amens? I heard one person say, amen. It's supposed to be just women, guys. <laughs> We're talking about pumpkin spice, and man, I don't want you to miss it because you're going to blink, it's going to be gone. You get around Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's going to start winding down. You can't get it anymore. So I, there's some new options out there for your pumpkin spice needs, and I want to show them to you on the screen, okay? I'll just kind of let them go through it, and I'll kind of guide you through. I'll narrate for you. Here's the first one. Let's see. Okay, pumpkin spice spam. If you're a spam fan, um, and I know all of you are, uh, you can pick this up at Walmart. It's so delicious and nutritious. Now it's pumpkin spice flavor. What's next? Okay, hand soap. This is for all the, the COVID needs, COVID season. Let's just pumpkin spice it up, right? Let's do it. What's next? Okay, watch out. Suppositories. I wouldn't know about this, but some of you maybe use suppositories, and now they have pumpkin spice flavor so congratulations okay college students and people on a budget ramen noodles uh, pumpkin spice sounds delicious yum yum okay there we go yes don't miss this one pumpkin spice bologna it's so delicious okay try it out today try it out. and lastly is pumpkin spice Doritos right so listen but here's the deal if you miss that they're only in for a season if you miss it you're going to miss out right so we understand that and we kind of have a tendency to miss a season sometimes spiritually when the Bible's very clear and my biggest fear is that sometimes we'll miss that and I don't want that to happen so the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3 1 it says this to everything everybody say everything, everything. to everything there is a season a time for purpose under heaven. So if that's the case in Scripture, you got to be able to make transition. you got to be able to make a move. you got to be able to uh, see where that God is leading you in some way and trying to grow you and be able to recognize that and transition, okay? Instead of just sitting back and letting life happen. There, there's so many people, man. A lot of the conversations I have with people is they express regret that they didn't act on what God called them to do. And they feel like they miss a season. And part of our prayer together is that God would maybe give them another opportunity to accomplish what they had originally called them to do. So some of you, man, though, are, are doing nothing significant because you're out of season, because you missed it. Maybe God gave you a big dream, but your faith has been so small, you, maybe you didn't act on it. And some of you lost your spiritual edge. You know what I mean? You used to really jump all over what God's done, and now you need him to reignite your passion. That's the good thing that I think happens at church. I think when we gather like this, we can hear God's word that's encouraging, that it does move us forward, man, that God does give us second chances. That's, that's the, one of the things I love about God. So let's look at verse 19. In the middle of the verse where uh, it tells us what he's doing, it tells us what Elisha is in the process of doing when God brings this new season up on him. It says that he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. So what that means was he was in the middle of doing what he was supposed to be doing, okay? He was just, 
he, he's working his family's farm. He's probably been there a long time. And, and you know, I bet the, the, the visual, when you're behind 12 oxen, there's no telling what the smell is there. A lot of people might start complaining about that. You know, this is my view all day long, every day. This is the smell. I wish I was doing something else. But what we see him doing here is he's being faithful in the moment. He's, I'm sure he's thinking, man, this is just a season. God's got something else for me, right? And it's easy to lose your passion when all you see is that view and that smell. Am I right? So here's the, here's the first thing I want you to know. Notice is that, that what I want you to take notice of Elisha is that he was being faithful at the task at hand. He was in the middle of being faithful. There's no evidence that he was complaining, right? That's one way to, to stiff arm God is with your complaints. He was faithful in the season that he was in. Now, write this down for yourself because it's coming back. Is be faithful in your current season. Write that down for your notes. It may be difficult. It may be undesirable. But there's something about that situation is you're practicing faithfulness. Until God opens the door for you, till he tells you to move, till you hear him give you an opportunity to move out of that situation, that environment, be faithful in your current season. Because here's what I figured out. Man, God is looking for faithful people. He's always faithful. That's the, that's the, the problem throughout the entire Bible and, and humanity is our lack of faithfulness. So, so maybe it's we're, we're transforming our mind to understand that God is trying to instill faithfulness in, in us, right? So here's what I found out, though. It's, you won't write it down, but it's so true. If you're halfway in something, you're halfway in, you're halfway out. If you're halfway in, you're halfway out. And I believe with my whole heart that, man, God loves to reward people who are faithful in their season, especially when it's difficult, especially when it's undesirable. If you're faithful in the little things the Bible says, you can be trusted with much. He gives that some thought, some consideration, some weight in our life. And his job probably wasn't his favorite thing to do. It's probably physically and emotionally uh, taxing on him, but he stayed faithful, the Bible says. And it's in the middle of his faithfulness, his daily routine, that God sends something new for him to take on, that gave him a new assignment, right? And so at the end of verse 19, so pay attention to that. What if God, uh, you're, you're in the middle of your situation, maybe you're praying to get out of it, or you're, you're, you're just ready to go. Uh, what is God teaching you? He's at least teaching us faithfulness. The Bible says in the rest of verse 19, it says, Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. And I looked that up. Man, what does that mean? What, what would that have meant? And it, first of all, physically it would have been a, uh, um, a, what they call a mantle. It would have been made out of probably multiple animal furs. It would have been very decorative. Uh, people would talk about it when they saw you wear it. It would have been probably pretty big. And, and it's almost like he was saying symbolically, what covered me will now cover you. You're my successor here okay i've been doing amazing things for god but i'm about to retire something else is about to happen in my life and you are the successor it's going to make a lot of sense in a little bit and so and it's almost like he said man i'm god's going to start working through you so he put this mantle this covering over elisha what used to cover me now covers you as well so i want to show you a couple of thoughts so how to transition into a new season Right, Not just fall and uh, pumpkin spice and Ugg boots and all those things, but spiritually speaking, God's moving you to a, into a new season, a new, maybe it's a new assignment, right? So I want to look at this, uh, Elisha's uh, kind of ridiculous commitment that he made, and I believe there's something to, to glean from that, something to learn from that, and God's going to call him to follow uh, Elijah. So here's the first thing is, you don't have to understand fully, you don't have to know the whole deal, to obey immediately. I'll say it more clearly. You don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. There's an expectation to obey, but not just to, not, is to, faith comes from, from not hesitating. Man, if we can close that gap between when God calls us something to actually stepping into it. That's where faith starts to come in. It's like, I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. God's not being all the way uh, informative to me right now, but I don't need that to be, to be willing to obey immediately. So when God calls you to do something, you don't have to know all the details right there on the spot. It says in verse 20, Elisha, then, right then, it's saying then, 
left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, and I will come with you. And notice he didn't have to pray about it. We didn't see anything where he made a list. Of, let me make some pros and cons and see which one seems to benefit me the best here. Because, you know, I got a pretty good gig here with my dad. I know sometimes around the stinky oxen, man, being behind them, that view that I got behind them. Uh, but, hey, man, I'm taking care of. There's some certainty there's a, there's a safety net here. So he didn't make a list of pros and cons. He didn't go back and say, let me talk let me, before I follow you, before I do what you've called me to do. It's obviously from God. Let me go check with my friends. I'm going to see which friends, some friends that I have that, man, I, I, I trust in what they say more than others. So let me kind of bounce off all of them, and I'll get back with you. Instead, he said, God, I know you're all in this. So you don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. A lot of people, uh, I've heard this pretty recently, said, what, what's your five-year plan you know, uh, well, for this church, for this church? And uh, I'm like, five-year plan? Well, first of all, that's not in the Bible, okay? Um, but the reality is, man, you can't plan divine opportunities. You just can't. All you can do, man, is you, you have to have a posture of spiritual readiness, man, to be able to, to pivot when God's calls you to do something so you can respond immediately without knowing all the details. So there is no five-year plan. The plan is to meet here regularly and find out what God's called us to do and respond to that, right? Because sometimes that five-year plan is our five-year plan, not God's. Okay, that's a safety net. That's, a, that's something that we create. And here's the way God will lead you sometimes, man, because he'll rev, rarely give you the deal, I mean, the, the details. So write this down. Uh, God often, often, is often strategically vague with the details because the details may t- talk us out of obedience. Okay? Because if he throws it all at us at once, we're going, man, that's overwhelming, man. That's one thing to say, come follow you, um, but, 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 but that end result that you want me to, that's overwhelming. I don't believe I can do that. But what God does in that moment, he, he, he knows sometimes we can't handle the details that we might not show up, right? So he loves us so much, he's saying, you know, I'm just going to give you the next step. I'm going to give you the next step, and I think he loves us enough to know that, that maybe we've we got a tendency to become overwhelmed. And God will often guide us with one word. A lot of times, this is about the details. Sometimes he doesn't give us the details. He'll give us one word. And I love one words. I love when Holly does that once a year uh, with a lot of people that that are either connected to this church, man, the people that choose to be connected to her. She loves to invest in them and be with them and meet them. Believe me. I'm like, "Ah, I'm I'm trying to catch her. And what's for What's for lunch? Oh, you got it. She's going to have coffee with people. She's talking to them on the phone. She's texting and Zooming. And that's awesome. That's her, that's her ministry, and I love it. And sometimes she'll give them this one word. She's like, hey, it's a new year. What's your, what's your new word? What's your one word? And that's great. And I thought Holly invented that. So, wow. But, you know, God, God's the one that invented the one word thing because he knew that we couldn't handle all the details. So I started kind of uh, peeling through the, uh, the Old Testament here. And number one, the first one I found was Moses. God told him to go. He said, go. I want you to go to Pharaoh. That's it. I want you to go. Abraham, he told him to go too. He said, go to the land. I'll show you. Just go. It's one word. I said, well, that's the Old Testament. Let's get to the New Testament. What does it say? And Peter, Peter, New Testament, Jesus is walking on water, and he, Jesus, uh, he said to Jesus, he said, if that's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, okay, Come. One word. You don't know all the details. It's just an opportunity for obedience. God keeps it simple for our sake, right? And so we understand this. Sometimes, man, uh, I went through with the first uh, service uh, just a few, maybe some words that one word uh, direction from God sometime. And some, some of you in a, a marriage, it's just like, ugh. It's just like the sore spot in your life. And, man, God... Hasn't come through just yet. It doesn't feel like he has. But maybe his one word for your marriage is stay. Maybe it's stay. Right? This isn't what I signed up for. It's not all it's cracked up to be. I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about, you know, just uh, maybe the word is stay because you don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. For some of you, man, maybe your health situation doesn't look that good. 
There was not a good prognosis for it. And maybe God's one word is trust. Just trust. Because you don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. And some of you, man, you've been coming to church here a long time. It's been a long time now. If you've been coming for more than a month, I mean, you're kind of involved here. Um, and I'm glad for that. I love it. Um, but it's always the goal quickly because that season that God has for you, sometimes it's time to, the one word is commit. That's some of your word, one word to you, maybe from the Lord is, man, you got to commit. Commit to something, right? And so, I, you know, I know how that one word thing is. Um, you know, when I was, I was just like everybody else that age when you're, out of high school and into college, I'm, like, I'm not going back to Gastonia. There's nothing there for me. Can't stand that place. I'm ready just to be gone. I never want to go back. I mean, that's been through my mind before, you know, probably like a lot of kids that age. But at some point, the Lord said, I want you there, so stay. I want you to stay. And that's how, it, and because I got to stay, I got to see so many things that the Lord is doing in so many people's lives. So some of you are going to hear from God, and maybe it's close to one word, And you're going to have to be crazy enough or at least obedient enough to say, man, I don't understand fully, but I can be obedient immediately, okay? So here's the second point I wanted to kind of touch on while you're trying to transition into seasons and not miss the opportunity that God has. Because there's so many people filled with regret because they never stepped into what God's called them. Something caused them to hesitate. I don't want to be that for, for your life. And the next one is people that God uses the most are usually those that hold on to the least. There's so many things, man, that we put our faith into, so many things that we grab a hold of tight that create security for us and certainty. And a lot of times that's not what matches Scripture, right? Watch what Elisha does in verse 21. So Elisha left him, left Elijah, and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant, right? So this was Elisha's livelihood. It's how he made money. It's how he filled his stomach. This is how he made a living. And and, and this is is a crazy what he did. And what he said, I'm going to do, he said, you know, I'm going to, there is no plan B. When you follow the Lord, right, a lot of times in life, that's all we do, saved or not, is we try to create certainty in our life. Generate a good income, make sure our house is good, you know, and nothing interrupts that to make sure we got a pretty decent car that runs. That time we got food on the table that we create certainty in our life. And here's what he said I've got this great call in my life, and I don't ever want to be distracted and tempted to go back the way that it was. I'm not going to seek comfort. That's not going to be the goal of mine. I'm going to kill these cows, and I'm going to burn these plows. And you can kind of see these uh, uh, killing the cows as kind of a symbolic, kind of a sacrifice that God calls to have is a, is a sacrifice. And what he's saying is, I'm, bl- I'm burning plan B. is basically what I'm doing. I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to, because it'll make you hesitate when things do get uncertain, when God's called you to something awesome. So write it down like this. If I'm following Jesus, there is no plan B. There's no plan B. As a dad, you know, I'm, if, if it's my daughters, I'm thinking, you know, well, I'm glad you have this much faith, but let's kind of keep our options open. Let's keep the plow, put them in the building, these plows, if, in case you need them in the future. We'll kind of put these oxes out the pasture, and just in case, you know. And that's our tendency to do that. But the reality is that most people are paralyzed by comfort. Wow. Paralyzed. Spiritually unable to move. Because they're so addicted to certainty. They crave certainty. But there's another thing about stepping out. There's another thing about burning plan B. Is that it gets you out of the baby pool spiritually. Keeps you moving forward. It keeps you from looking back. That's what you'll find in scripture, man. That people are so moved by God. They're so laser focused what they call them to do that they don't look back they rid themselves of that certainty and Jesus encountered Peter in Luke 5 is a New Testament example of that 
Peter, and they'd been fishing all night. Of course, they had their nets and their boats. It's what they did for a living. They made money. It's a family business. And they've been doing it for generations. Same thing. When Jesus came up, he said, follow me. And the Bible says, just kept it short. He didn't, we don't see all the details that he had. He said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. That's about it. That's all you get at this point. And the Bible says that they left their nets. They left their boats. They left the boats full of fish to follow Jesus. And that was just as crazy as killing cows and burning plows. Because the reality is we're not molded in times of comfort. We're just not. Some of the greatest spiritual growth you'll ever experience is out of the lack of comfort. When things get difficult. But we're so busy trying to dig ourselves out of discomfort or, or create certainty and comfort. That we miss that, man, and we miss that season in our life, man. Because for a lot of people, there's no way I could entertain the idea of leaving my job. There's just no way I can do that. Hey, I played sports all my life. And listen, the Lord, he, and here's what they don't see. Is the Lord's got so much better than what you can create for your own life. And it seems so foreign to people. And, but God's going to speak to you at some point, man, because he wants you to have a plow-burning type of faith. There's something. What is it that you hold on to? Remember that application point earlier? What is it that you hold on to so tightly that, God, you can have all these other areas of my life, but not, not my job, hands off. That creates certainty for me, God. I'm going to say at some point, man, that you've got to learn to hold on to those things pretty loosely. God, you can have it if you want it. There's something in your mind and your heart that says, God, if you call me to that, I will do it. I will surrender that. Okay? Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's, it's finances. Maybe it, whatever it might be for you. Um, and I want to point this out to you that risk reflects faith. It's risky to follow Jesus. Statistics tell us that probably a third of y'all get that. A third of y'all realize that it's not of any congregation. Realize it's not just showing up to church on Sunday and I'll see you next week. Hopefully. That there's some risk, that risk reflects faith. And I love it. There's so many stories that's come through this church about just plow burning faith. Like I'm, I've walked, people that have walked away from things to do what God's called them to do. That happens quite a bit around here. Right? They said, you know, I've had to make a choice on comfort and certainty. And I had to choose the Lord in that. And, and watch this in Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 6. These are great examples of faith, the Bible says. Here's what faith does. It, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. Okay, it, it demonstrates that. It's our faith. And it is the evidence. So faith is also evidence of things we cannot see. It goes on to say, Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. There's people watching you on how much faith you have, and, and we're seeing that there are people that showed so much faith that they've got a good reputation to that for people around that are watching. It goes on to say, by faith, we understand the entire universe was formed at God's command. Right? We have an understanding of God, a better understanding because of our faith, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It goes on to say in verse 4, it was by faith, this is faith, faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence. There it is again. Faith is your evidence of who God is and that you're connected to him. That he was a righteous man and, and God showed approval of his gifts. Although Abel uh, is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. One more. It's by faith that Enoch was taken up into heaven without dying. That's what got him there. He didn't have to experience death. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was best. He was known as a person who, who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. So this idea of faith, right? Of saying, I don't know all the details. There's going to be some uncertainty. You're not going to know everything that God has planned for you. But that faith pleases God. And it's, it's impossible to please him without faith. So at some point, there's uncertainty. There is risk. 
So tell the person next to you, man, or on the way out the door. Maybe they confide in you into something. Say, look, kill them cows. Burn them plows. Let that be a part of your conversation to encourage people. Right? Don't get peed on me. They're going to probably see this and come after me and arrest me. Or y'all just bail me out. But that's what you want to tell them. That's what we want to say. Man. And what you're saying with that is, man, listen, please don't seek certainty all the time. Don't always have a plan B. I wish you'd write this down. If I'm going to if I'm going to step towards my destiny, it is what God's going to call me to do. This assignment in this life. I have to, I'll have to step away from my security. Whatever gives you security is going to be challenged by God. Because he's not going to have anything that's on the throne ahead of him. So remember, you don't have to fully understand God to obey him immediately. And he uses people the most who hold on to the least. I love how this account in scripture ends in verse 21. It says, Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Man, that's like you're connected to him. When you follow somebody like that, okay, you become their disciple. You are their family. You eat. You sleep together. You learn. You mimic, right? You, you become a little version of them. So there's this idea that I'm leaving that family for this family, this connection here. So here's what I wanted you to get today, man. There's a lot of, lot of things in there that allow us to uh, kind of get some application. I think that's what a lot of people enjoy about this church and our commitment to teaching the Word, that you can apply it, man. This isn't, this isn't out of reach for you. That you don't have to be a theologian to apply God's Word. There's a lot of application here from the life of Elisha. And to walk away from things. But here's what I wanted you to get. This is such a... Now that we're, we're done and we understand the story, we've heard it. Man, how does this relate to Jesus Christ? Because all the Old Testament does. It's such a parallel to this story. The story of Jesus is such a parallel to this. That God says, look, Jesus, I've got somewhere else for you to be. And I want you to find a successor. And we are, when we put our faith in Jesus, that's what we are right we are accepted into the family of God right we're like orphans that all of a sudden have a family and the Bible says that man we're going to be able to do Jesus said this with his own mouth he said this in John 14 12 he says truly truly I say to you the one who believes in me the works that I do he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father. You hear the story in the parallel? I've got somebody, i got another assignment. God's bring me into heaven. I've got to go, you know, got to go to the cross. I'm going to heaven, prepare a place, right? And you are here to do the work. You are here. If you've got your faith placed in Jesus, you're here to do the work, right? And so I want that for you more than anything to realize, man, this series, uh, the last series about I love my church and just, understanding how important it is to gather and meet like this. Some people got that. They got it. They are more committed now to the church body, right, in their attendance and what they're um, connecting with while they're in the church. And this series is about, hey, we are set apart. We are different than everybody around us, man. We can't, we can't be. We need to be outsiders while we're on this planet. Everybody else is saving money trying to survive and, and have hope in the things that they can create on their own. We are totally dependent on the Lord. Okay? It's part of the mark of following Jesus is that you walk away from something when it does not make sense. When it can't be made certain. When you can't explain it to people that wonder why you're so obedient when it makes no sense. It's because we're set apart. It's what Jesus did. It's what he's called us to do. And I'm thankful for the life of Elisha. We get to kind of read that to reinforce what Jesus has already called us to.